This is a C-130 Hercules transport aircraft. It's Australia's uh, military airlifter that's designed to continue to carry out tactical operations. To, so to land on short airstrips or to drop paratroops or gear out of the back by parachute. You might have seen it over the last 20 years operating into or out of Afghanistan or the Middle East, but it's not just a combat aircraft. It also does humanitarian missions. So we've used it to locate uh, lone yachtsmen in the Southern Ocean who've been missing, and it's dropped supplies to keep them safe until they can be rescued by ship. It helped evacuate or medivac the survivors from the Bali bombing in 2002. And it's also used to support our farmers. So if the roads are closed due fire or flood, this aircraft can drop supplies out of the back so that they can feed their cattle. This is the cockpit of the C-130J. And as you can see, it's designed to be flown by two pilots. And it's got two twin head-up displays. This is a close-up of the head-up display. It's a piece of see-through glass, and you project the flight symbology onto it so the pilot can actually see so they can land precisely on a short runway at night or fly below the tops of mountain tops in the valleys and still be able to keep their head outside the cockpit rather than having to look inside at the instruments. So I was the test pilot uh, that tested this aircraft for the Australian Air Force. I work with Lockheed Martin in the United States. And when I first sat in the cockpit to evaluate this head-up display symbology, this is what I saw. Yes, a blank screen. Why might that be? That's because this aircraft, like every other military aircraft at that time, had been designed for a pilot of a certain size. And that size was a, a Navy male pilot of the 1960s. <laughs> so how does that work? Well, we all come in different shapes and sizes, and we have to know something about the shape and size of people so that we can design things to fit them, whether it's clothing, or whether it's seats, or whether it's cars or buses or planes or trains. We need to know the size. The, the study of the size of people is called anthropometrics. And anthropometrics are measured in percentiles. So if, for example, in height, you are a one percentile person, that means that 99% of the population will be taller than you. So here's a diagram. So as you can see, men and women, and this is just in stature or height, men and women have quite different profiles. Um, and if you were to design for, for example, the fifth percentile woman, who would be 152 centimetres tall, to the 95th percentile male, who would be 188 centimetres tall, you then have something that's designed for 90% of the population. But the head-up display was just designed for the blue group. So with a head-up display, in order to be able to see it, you have to have your eyes in a thing called the HUD eye box. Now, the eye box is this imaginary space. It's about five centimetres high. It's about 12 to 15 centimetres wide. And if your eyes aren't in that spot, you can't see the symbology at all. So as you can see, that's me sitting in the C-130 cockpit, and my eyes are below the HUD eye box, hence the screen was blank. So we managed to fix this problem. We put the seat up by two notches. It was a design change. And there you go, my, HUD, my eyes are now in the eye box, but there's flow on effects from this. So now that my seat's higher, my feet are further away from the rudder pedals. <laughs> so we had to redesign the rudder pedals so they had further travel forward. And also, uh, once we solved that, this aircraft is flown with a control yoke and roll. And because my seat was so high, the control yoke wouldn't roll. So we then had to make the yoke narrower and by narrowing the yoke, it made the aircraft heavier to fly and changed the whole characteristics of it. And we had to redo quite a lot of the test program. So in case you're thinking, you know, well, this is 20 years ago, how could that happen today? In only April this year, NASA scheduled a spacewalk that inadvertently involved two female astronauts. But they only had one suit that, was, that fitted both of them. So they had to reschedule and send a male along as well. So NPR Radio in 2006 reported that this limitation in the number of smaller suits for women was actually restricting the number of women who could be astronauts and go into space. They used to have smaller suits in the 1960s, but when they had a glitch and had to redesign, they just got rid of the small one and they now only have medium, large and very large suits. So in the Air Force uh, in the past and still now, women have trouble because the helmet and the face mask are designed for a face that is both wider and longer than the average female face. So things like the oxygen mask, for example, has to be clamped on so tight that it can be painful so that it doesn't fall off when the women pull G. 
The aircraft seats are designed for male. We talked a little bit about the C-130J. Many women have to, or smaller people, have to go out to the aircraft with two, three, sometimes four cushions so that they can put a cushion behind them and under their butt so they can actually reach the control columns. The armour that women wear when they go into combat is often too large and can make it difficult or uncomfortable to fly. And the pistol holster that is normally meant to sit at the shoulder is actually too long for the female torso and they often have to have it strapped to the leg. Even something like a G-suit, here's me with a G-suit, it's the thing that goes around your abdomen and your legs and it consists of air bladders and when you pull G, the air bladders inflate and they push against your legs and abdomen to keep the blood in your chest and head so that you don't black out. So these things are designed for men though, so they're straight up and down. So for most women, to get them to fit around the hips, they're too loose around the waist. So even when it inflates, it doesn't do its job properly. So you may think that uh, these are just problems that apply to a rare and unusual few, but it's surprising how many things there are that are designed with men in mind. This is a fifth percentile female hand in comparison with a 95th percentile male hand. Think about the smartphone. The smartphones are designed for a male to operate one-handed, whereas most females need at least two hands to operate the phones. And don't get me started about trying to fit them in your pocket. <laughs> That's if you have pockets. <laughs> <laughs> So even in the home, the, maybe the traditional female, design, female domain, some things are surprisingly still designed with men in mind. Maybe women don't eat salsa. <laughs> or pickles. And am I the only one who can't reach the top shelf in the bookcase or the top kitchen cupboards without having to stand on something? In my home, in my garage door, the roller door, we've got a piece of rope attached to the handle so that I can pull it back down after I get out of the car. Now, we're just used to this. We think that this is the way things are always designed, this is the way they have to be, and we make adjustments. But should we have to do that? Even in cars, it's only recently that the safety of cars has been designed with women in mind. It's only in the last five or 10 years that they've used female uh, dummies to actually test, air, to test uh, car accidents. Um, in 2011, they found that female drivers had a 47% chance of higher injury because the car was actually designed with a male dummy in mind rather than a female. Even seatbelts have only recently started to be designed for women where there's an option to actually lower the shoulder holster. Um, a, a, the sort of design that would normally work well for women would actually be a four-point harness because it distributes evenly across the breast, but it's only racing car drivers that get these, and they're usually men. Once we hit the work domain, it becomes even more obvious. A lot of tools are, desize, are designed for the size of a men's grip. Uh, that's me trying to grab my sander at home on the right-hand side, and as you can see, it's quite, it's quite difficult to grasp, and I can only do jobs for a small period of time. A brick is designed for the width of an average male hand. A lot of these things we just assume that's always the way it is and it's the only way it can be and that women will just need to adjust. Even something as simple as a ladder, the rungs in a ladder are space for the average male step height. So women can find it quite difficult to get up and down a ladder safely, especially people such as firefighters when they're carrying heavy loads. The Australian Bureau of Statistics in 2018 found only 12% of the construction industry were female, and most of those are in the office, not on the construction side. And even more disturbing, this has worsened over the last 20 years. So perhaps it's de the design of some of our tools th that is contributing to this statistic. So before you think it's just blue collar workers, these are laparoscopic tools used in surgery. Uh, they found in studies that women or those with smaller hands have had much more wrist injuries from using these particular um, tools because of the height and the grip size. Um, in particular, um, the stapler for most people with smaller hands, such as women, requires a two-handed grip. And the height of the table can mean that people have back problems or back injuries. So that's to do with grip. But let's think about temperature. 
Even our office temperature has been designed with men in mind. You guessed it. The, the average temperature for an office of 20 degrees Celsius was designed for a 40-year-old, 70-kilogram male in the 1960s. If you're a woman and you're feeling a bit cold at work and need to rug up, that's because the temperature is about five degrees Celsius too cold for you. So they've done a study on this um, and looked at increasing the temperature from 20 to 25 degrees Celsius and found that performance for women improved quite dramatically. So 44% fewer keyboard errors, errors and 150% increased keying output by putting that temperature up by five degrees. So what are the implications of this for women? What it means is it means women will find it more difficult to operate in the world. It means they may be put off from doing some things. They'll be looking at it and thinking, well, why don't I do that well? And blame themselves rather than the fact that, it's not be that things have not been designed for them. Some occupations they just won't try. And the ones that they do try, they might be judged as less competent purely because the tools designed to do the job are not fitted for their particular size. But we can design that works for everybody, and we should do it. Look at the smartwatch. We can have different size smartwatches, and that jar of salsa is going to taste just as good whether it comes in a short, fat, or tall, skinny jar. <laughs> Even robotic surgery. The new da Vinci machine has pretty much taken size out of the equation. So rather than sitting at the operating table, the operator sits at a separate chair at a computer. Now, while everybody finds this particular machine difficult to master, a study in 2019 found that women actually excelled in this and performed both faster and more accurately than men when using a robotic simulator. Designing for, for female gender not only works for women, but it also works for any of those who are maybe smaller and not as strong as the average. Alison Bell uh, did some study in New South Wales and found that a lot of older people in hospitals were actually suffering malnutrition because they couldn't open the food packages on, the, on there that they were given to eat. 40% uh, couldn't open the drink bottles and 80% experienced difficulty with at least one item of food and of that 80%, a third of them didn't even ask for help. So what do we do? How can, how can we design for women? Well, if you ask men, They'll say, pink it and shrink it. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll add a pink tax to make it more expensive. But, but, but what if we ask women? What if we ask women what they want? Well, Klaus Schrader in Denmark did that. He talked to women about what they wanted with their technology. And he found that they wanted it to be functional rather than just look good. If they were wearing their technology, they wanted it to blend in with their clothing and not stand out the way men do. And they also wanted to be, be able to use their, their technology as a social tool rather than just as an end in itself. Now, not only could we ask women, let's include them on the design team. So in 2018, women made up only 22% of the, the design workforce in the UK. And in Australia, it was no better, only 19.5%. And if you look at the number of female leaders in design, it's even worse. So let's try and encourage women and get more of them on the design team. So finally, if we want to improve design for everyone, we need to really think about gender-based design. We need to think about inclusion. We need to think about diversity. If we want gender equality, then we need to think about gender-based design. We need to think about designing not just for male pilots, but for all pilots. We need to think about not just tools for those who are already doing the work, but tools that might help others who are currently excluded from the workplace to participate in the workforce. We've all got a part to play in, de in designing our world, so let's all play that part by making it an equal playing ground. Thank you.